so I alluded to this, I think, in the previous Sunday session. One very common area of, of interview questions for, for the embedded world are questions that revolve around uh, callbacks or callback functions and how one designs and implements them. And in the Sunday session, we talked about a number of cases that usually involved one entity trying to use some library and derive some purpose from that library. So maybe they wanted to register for some sort of callback, like a timer callback, uh, or register for some sort of event callback, such as, for example, the system just turned on or someone just pushed the mouse button. I want a callback to be invoked to notify me when that occurs. Uh, similarly, we also talked about callbacks in the context of completions, such as a, a pipe write or a network operation where you, where you initiate something that might be internally blocking. It might take some time for that actually that action to complete, but you might you want to be notified once it has completed. So the callback is used in that sense. Uh, this happens to be kind of a class of callbacks where you are both the the caller and the implementer in a sense. Like you you're going to design APIs that use callbacks, even though there isn't any other external library that's that's taking advantage of it. This particular implementation or this particular question to implement a map, I think is noteworthy. In for one, it's it's a conceptually simple question. The code is also relatively concise, but it's an area that a lot of people have challenges with. And it's a it's a good way for me as an interviewer to kind of dig into how well do you understand things like arrays, pointers, function pointers, uh, void pointer arithmetic, that sort of thing. Uh, as an interviewer, I am I am all about trying to get the most bang for my buck and ask questions that I can learn a lot about the uh, the candidate from. So this is one category of questions, and this is one particular question that that I've seen before. And for those that might be might be familiar with some kind of scripting languages, these sort of things might be built into the language already or built into the standard library. But in the C world, nothing like this exists. In particular, what we're trying to do here is apply a caller provided function for each entry in an array. And let me first kind of show you what I'm trying to do. And then we can talk about how it might be implemented. So let's let's focus on this top half first. What I ultimately want is the ability, and once again, this is conceptual. We can kind of ignore the actual details of the code. Conceptually, what I want is to write a function that operates on one entry, one entry presumably of an array. So I have an input to my function and I have an output to my function. And my function is going to apply some sort of manipulation to that particular item. So that's what I want to do. And ultimately what I want to have is the ability to pass in an array of items and also have some sort of notion of an output. Maybe I, there's an intention of modifying the input array. You can kind of phrase this question either way. Or you have a separate output array where the, the result of this manipulation is going to occur. And then finally, what we want is some sort of universal map function that will do everything I just said I wanted it to do. That's, that's the challenge here, is how do we write a universal map function that works regardless of what the data type happens to be. Let's look a little bit closer at, at some of the, the details here, and then we'll start looking at or start talking about what a good function prototype and function implementation would be for a map. So first I want to point out that our inputs are voids. 
And that's because once again, we want our map function to support any potential data type, which means we as the entity that ultimately implement this operation, the my, my function, we need to cast that input and output to the data types that we know that it is. Because we obviously can't do some sort of manipulation on void itself. But similarly, we don't want to hard code in the map definition, the map prototype, the fact that this can only be done on uint 32s. On that note, let's look a little bit about this map prototype itself. Here I have the let's do a highlighter mode. Here we have the input, the input array. And I am passing this in as a pointer. Since this is an array, we can pass it in as a pointer. We also can pass in the output as a pointer. We also want to pass in how many entries are there in this array. And maybe we could have used size of to do this, but I just hard coded the value 10 here because 10 is what I know the size of this array is. We want to specify our callback function to be invoked. This callback function is going to ultimately be invoked 10 times. It's going to be invoked however many entries I place here. And then finally, I need to specify how large each one of my entries is. As you notice, nothing in this line in specifies that it's a 32-bit integer. I, as the invoker of the map function, know that it's a 32-bit integer that I'm passing in. But the implementation of maps doesn't have that knowledge. All right, so let's jump into at least one potential implementation of malloc. And I guess I should say, sometimes I like these sorts of these coaching sessions to be interactive. In this particular case, I thought it was more worthwhile for me just kind of to go through some code uh, rather than talking about code in the abstract. So hopefully you can bear with the fact that this is slightly less interactive, but hopefully we can get through a little bit more code and talk through a little bit more code because of it. So we have our, well, so the first thing we always want to talk about when it comes to these sorts of questions is what is the function pointer prototype going to be? And I showed it in the previous slides, so there's nothing surprising here, but we need to want to be familiar with how do we write out function pointers or how do we define function pointer types in this case in the C language? But this is something that I think is just kind of expected of, of a embedded software engineering interview that you, you can write uh, type defs for function pointers and make use of them throughout your code. So obviously this is the syntax. Uh, but once again, I have voids as my inputs and my outputs. And just to reemphasize, the reason why I'm using void here as opposed to uint32 is that I'm trying to write a function, write a map function that can support any data type, support booleans, support ints, support floats, support structures. It doesn't matter. The, the, the prompt that I was given is I need to write a generic function that can apply an operation to array of any data type. So everything here needs to be voids. And the same thing goes here with our input and output arrays for our map function. For the exact same reason, our map function needs to support as input any potential data type. One, one variant of this you might oftentimes see is instead of void, you might see uint eight star or sometimes even car star. Sometimes these, let's say you take the uint8 example, sometimes uint8 can be helpful in indicating that what we're trying to do is make use of a, well, but what we're ultimately going to do is, is treat this as if it were a byte array. So having a uint8 star kind of implies byte array and some people like that sort of interface, but conceptually what we have here is a void star because what we're going to do is, is cast it to something else, or ultimately it will be casted to something else. And oftentimes void star is a good indication that uh, there is no type ultimately, although the type is unknown versus uint8 star 
can sometimes give the wrong impression that there is in fact a type that is only intended to be a map for uint8 arrays. So in any case, we use void star that indicates that this either is typeless or in other words, can be applied to any type. We also have our array length. So this is the number of entries in our array. We have our apply function. And then finally, the element length. And I'm gonna go into in a second why the element length get, is so important. This is probably the field that most people neglect or don't even consider when they first start implementing something like a map function. And sometimes they ultimately realize it, sometimes they ultimately don't. Uh, but this, this one is gonna be key. For those of you that have, have been with me before, you know that I just love using uint pointer. Uh, uint pointer is logically just an integer. And on a 64-bit system, it is the exact same thing as a uint 64t. Like those, those would be typed def together. I'm gonna get to the comment here in just a second. Uh, although remember the, uh, the Q and A box is great. Chat only goes to me, so just keep that in mind. Uh, uint pointer is is identical to uint 64. They they are, they're both numbers. The only interesting thing about uint pointer is it is guaranteed to be large enough to hold or represent any valid address pointer address in the system so in as a general kind of statement if you're running on a 64-bit system uint pointer is going to be a 64-bit unsigned integer if you're running on a 32-bit system uint pointer will be type def to a uint32. So there's nothing fancy going on here. And some people just default to using one of these fixed length values directly. But I think uint pointer is nice because it makes it clear that what this value ultimately is supposed to be doing is representing an address. And you can avoid any concern about switching between a 32 and 64 bit system. Uh, someone asked me on on uh, Sunday, I think about malloc, and I think I asked someone to implement malloc once. And they just assumed throughout their code that we were going to be running it on a 32 bit system. And the tool that that uh, my company happens to use uses a 64 bit architecture uses a 64 bit uh, compiler. So all of the code they wrote failed miserably because they made a poor assumption that could have been completely avoided because uh, oh, if they had used uint pointer instead. So I'm an evangelist for that. So I'm going to cast my input and output arrays to a uint pointer because I'm going to ultimately do some math, some, some addition specifically with regards to this. And you can't add numbers to void stars. You, you, you mean, sorry, you, you, can't, uh, you can't manipulate the void stars in a convenient way. You need to transition it to a integer type or an actual uh, defined data type like, like int or float or so on. So the, the comment I got, which is, which is a good comment, uh, it was, I wish element length was size T. So right here, I wish this was size T because the length can be very big, which is an excellent, excellent point. And I would say that your suggestion is probably a distinct improvement upon the code that I wrote here. So this is kind of along the same lines of, well, what is a size, oops, size underscore T? And size underscore t is kind of like uint pointer in that it is a it is a int integer type that is guaranteed to be large enough to store the size of any object on the system. So if you were to call size of what is the maximum value it might return, size t should be capable of representing that. At least in my experience, size t and uint pointer generally have the same size. 
but they're not necessarily required or guaranteed to have the same size. So what we ultimately passed in over here was the size of something. So uh, well, PXP0819 uh, has a fantastic point that using size T here for element length is probably the, also kind of the best data type to use. So I'm going to I'm going to agree with your statement, although I am going to give one one pitfall, both for size T and UN pointer. And this is if you if you recall in the past, I've said when, when it comes to defining structures, especially if a structure is going to be used on different architectures uh, or uh, attempted to be sent over the network in some way, shape or form or Peru. Thank you. Uh, it's always, in my mind, best to use fixed length fields within that structure. So if you're, if you're defining struct Y and you're going to have some fields X and A uh, short B, so on, these fields, well, some fields are, some fields aren't, but some of these fields may not have a, a guaranteed and concrete size across different systems. So and we, we know we talked about the case of uh, uh, long a lot and how using long sometimes is 32 bits and sometimes is 64 bits, depending on what system you're running on. Uh, even, even if you're running on a 64-bit system, on Windows, long is going to be 32 bits, and on Linux, it's going to be 64 bits. So using these less well-defined data types can be dangerous for those use cases and structures. So using fixed length types like these is, is beneficial uh, because you, you get what you ask for regardless of what system you're running it on. Uh, Uint pointer and size T fall more on the category of these sorts of fields. So in the same, for the same reason why I wouldn't recommend using long in a, a structure that needs to be safe with regards to different architectures and, and uh, different operating systems. Uh, I think size T and uint pointer are kind of equally dangerous in that sense because they will have a different value on different architectures. Uh, and there's one other issue I have with size T, although I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment. Um, well, size T is also huge. Uh, if size T is 64 bit, 64 bits, very rarely, not that it isn't a thing, but very rarely do you have the size of a structure, let's say, that's going to be so large that it can't be represented by a 32-bit number. Once again, not that it isn't possible, uh, but it's, it's, I would say it's one of those less common things that, or I would even go so far as to say it's ultimately rare that structures or something that you might try and represent the size of is going to be that large. And passing around 64 bit, a 64 bit type when all you really probably need is 32 bits may be, may be an efficiency hit on certain systems in certain cases. So maybe that might be an argument in favor of using UN32 in something like this. But I would still agree with Peru that in general, size T would be the, the, the better choice here. Cool, all right, back to, back to the implementation of maps. Sorry for that little detour. Uh, but I, I see that so often in, in interviews, people making these, these kind of silly small mistakes that just breaks their code entirely. And it's very disappointing to see. So we've casted our input and outputs arrays to these integer types. And now we're going to have a for loop. Ultimately, we need to iterate through the array. That's the whole purpose here. And we want to iterate, in the case of the previous slide, we want to iterate 10 times. We want to iterate how many, how many entries are in the array. And it's this next line that probably gets people, that the 
people probably can understand most of this. And they might get the prototype wrong the first time, but it's this next line that people get the most confused about. And I've seen some really goofy ways of going about doing this. Not that, not that my way is the only way or may not even be the best way, but I've seen some really silly, uh, fragile and dangerous ways of doing this. And what we're trying to do here is if we have an array, and let's just say I have an array with three entries, and each one of these entries is four bytes. What I ultimately want to do is invoke my callback function first with that address, next with that address, and then finally with that address. That's what I ultimately want to do. So the first time I invoke it, I'm going to invoke it with the address of the beginning of the array. And then the next time I invoke it, I'm going to invoke it with the beginning of the array plus four or the beginning of the array plus four times the size of the element. And then once again, for that next element in the array. So in this particular case, I am going to maintain a offset counter doing multiplication would potentially remove the need for this. But for each iteration of the loop, I'm going to take my input address and I want to add some offset. And then I'm ultimately going to cast that back to void so I can call my callback function. And I do the exact same thing with the output because I expect the input and the output, or I'm requiring the input and the output to have the same data type, to have the same element length. After I invoke that callback function, then I'm going to increment the offset by the element length. So the very first time this was invoked, it had value zero. And in this example, I'm going through the next time it's invoked, it'll have value four. So it'll be input plus four. And it'll get me over here like I wanted. And then cast that back to a void star. Probably me walking it through through this like, like we have been, probably this was hopefully reasonably straightforward. But it all goes back to my use of uint pointer. Because I used an integer type, I can just add how many bytes I want to increment it. In this case, I wanted to increment it by four bytes. So I added the number four to it, and then I casted it back to a pointer. If we tried to use some other type, or worse still, tried to do some sort of pointer arithmetic, these sorts of things end up getting more confusing quicker. Because if you remember, if we have, let me actually go off here to the side a little bit. Let me change the color to make it clear. I'm talking about something different. If we have something like uint32 some pointer, and if we say pointer plus one, what we're not getting is this pointer plus one byte. What we're getting is size of uint32, four bytes, further past pointer. So pointer plus one, in this particular case up here, gets us here four bytes later. So and that, that's just kind of pointer arithmetic 101. But people, the moment you, you want someone to do something in a generic way, uh, like using this element length, using pointer arithmetic now becomes not the right choice. If we were, for example, to have changed this such that we only were going to support uh, uint 32s, then we could use pointer arithmetic to increment through the array if we were so inclined. But because we're trying to make it generic, incrementing a pointer to a a standard type by one increments the pointer by the number of bytes that that type uh, requires. Okay, so let's actually go back to that previous slide then and look at this again, kind of with that in mind. So with, with our input, it is casted to, to void once the map function is invoked. The output is casted to void. And we pass in 
four for the size of each entry in our array so that that loop can appropriately go from the address here to the address here to the address here. If, for instance, we passed in the wrong value, say two, what we would end up getting is we would be calling our callback function twice per input array entry. So we'd be calling it once at the location at the beginning of three, and then again, halfway through three. It's, it would be as if we were treating this array as in a, an array of shorts rather than an array of ints. One thing that sometimes throws people a little bit for a loop is, well, why are we doing this cast up here? And I, I said this before, but let me just say it again. We, whoever it is who's implementing main, knows what type they're passing in for input. They know that they're passing in a uint32. So they can safely do this cast, well, not, maybe not safely, but they can relatively safely do that cast because the same person who wrote this code wrote this code. A totally valid complaint about this general design is if someone wrote code like this and then five years down the line, someone else was working on it and didn't know anything about it, they might not realize that these two have such an intricate connection or so, so intimately related. And someone may accidentally down the line do something like change this to two or potentially change this data type to something else, not realizing how all of this works. And there's nothing that the compiler is going to do to flag any of this as a warning. And certainly not as an error because everything here is ultimately being casted to void, a void star, and then being casted to something else. There's nothing the compiler can even attempt to do to catch that sort of mistake. Some static analyzers might be able to have some luck here, but the compiler, uh, at least in my experience, is not going to uh, notice or flag this as a, as a warning. So this kind of code overall might be a less safe thing to do. So there might be an argument against having something like this in your system, but well, the prompt that we were given by the interviewer was to implement this. So here we are. So let me take a pause now and open it up. Are there any questions people have about this question or this kind of class of questions for implementing map? How would you describe the map function again? I didn't really understand what it did until you showed the code. Sure, yeah, it, totally. Uh, this was this is one way I've 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 seen it kind of written down as is apply a caller provided function to each entry in an array. Uh, and it, you might also if you were to append to this might say uh, an array of any arbitrary data type if we really wanted to be clear. But you're right this. This statement is still somewhat vague, and while this certainly was my interpretation of what they wanted to see and what they wanted to do, maybe there's some other approach that that we could potentially take that uh, would would suffice this. So, asking some follow up questions for what like. For example, are there any constraints about the data type? Are there any constraints about the length of the array? Uh, I, one thing that this statement doesn't say is whether or not the value is going to be modified in place or whether there's going to be a separate output array. So I happen to choose to implement it as if there were an output array. But from this prompt, there is nothing that actually clarifies one way or the other. Apply a caller provided function to each entry in an array could very easily be interpreted as uh, get rid of the out array and change this line around such that the, uh, well, and change this around as well, such that there is only an input to the application function. And that application function, as we have it implemented here, would simply modify the input however it wishes. So it might say like uh, n equals n plus one, for instance. So that would be a totally valid alternative interpretation 
of what this question is asking for. So if if you recognize that that's a something that's unclear, definitely worthwhile to ask about that at the beginning, just to make sure that you're doing what the interviewer actually is hoping for. Uh, hopefully that addressed your question. Uh, and I, I'm going to apologize uh, with regards to pronouncing your name. Uh, 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 Dragon, is that right? Yes. Oh, I got it right. Perfect. Excellent. You, you have a question? I just want to comment that map is uh, another way to something that could be written as a, as a loop, as instead of written as a one line function call. So map essentially implements the uh, way you loop uh, through the array and then uh, apply <clears throat> function to each element of the array. Yeah, yeah I think map is something oh, for those that once again might might program. Yes, I think that that's that's kind of confusing. And then another one, there is a another one is a filter, and then another one is where you. I mean, there, there are a number of these. Yeah, like exactly. Two, uh, so similar yeah, thing. this this question kind of came from that kind of the, the the same map notion that is coming from these higher level languages. And as you point out, those many other variants that kind of ask you to do the same thing. Uh, and the, typically the, implement, the design and implementation kind of follows the same model that, that I've gone through here. Yes, so like, like, a, like a map will always, like if you have like array of n elements, the output will be n elements which are modified each element. And then filter, you have an input one array, but then it gives you maybe reduced number of elements, another one. And then there is another one, which is I think you uh, kind of collapse array into one number by applying iteratively from left side to the right side or from the right side to the left side. So these are like three different ways you can uh, manipulate data. To, I think it's called functional. Like map is kind of functional. Yep. Well, uh, like this function that you pass is function and then this is functional because kind of applies this not to one element, more like an effect to a vector. Like it's called, yep. it's more like, like a um, function on a vector as opposed to function on a scalar, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely right. And there's actually another one that we could potentially do that might be a little bit more. So filtering is, is arguably easier uh, in the sense that your output is, is going to be the same number or fewer entries as the input. Uh, but you could potentially go the other way as well and say that you're allowed to, to, to output more things than were input. Uh, there also are, are questions that could be asked that might involve rearranging entries in the array. Uh, so for example, if someone wanted to do some sort of sort, uh, but where the actual behavior of the sort was, was kind of user defined. Uh, so rearranging, expanding, uh, contracting, the output relative to the input are all, all variants of this question that, that could easily be asked. 